My long-awaited book, Astrology Realized, is finally available and waiting for you at Amazon and other online retailers. Get one for you, your loved one, or as a gift. All part of your fabulous journey to understanding astrology. Enjoy. Hello, fabulous friends and fans. I am your host, Nadia Shaw, and this is Synchronicity, and this is your moment of synchronicity. I'm here with Benjamin Dykes. Now, I am here at the NCGR conference in Philadelphia, summer 2013, and earlier today I was in a talk of Benjamin's, and it was just so amazing and enlightening. He has a PhD in philosophy and is a translator of different astrological texts from Latin and Arabic, and not only a translator, but in many ways also an illuminator, at least that's what I found. Welcome, Benjamin. Thank you for having me. So talk a little bit about the history. Let's just start there. What, to make it personal, right, so people get to know you, what is it that you personally have really resonated with as you researched the history, and what was that process and motivation like for you? Well, I do traditional astrology, and for me, what really mattered was uh, I had tried learning modern astrology for many years and, and didn't feel comfortable with it. But as I was teaching uh, at the university, teaching philosophy to undergraduates, I was teaching the philosophy of Aristotle and the Stoics and other people. And I rediscovered traditional texts like William Lilly and others, and I realized this astrology has a very similar philosophical view of the universe and of happiness as what I'm teaching in class. And so I felt like this was the kind of astrology I could really embrace. So I really uh, liked it for that reason and then found it completely fascinating. And as I began translating material, because there was not a lot of material in English, I realized that um, the history of astrology is, in a way, also a history of languages and civilizations. Because as one civilization might take over and spread its language, it would pick up astrology from the previous one. So, in a way, traditional astrology is not just about chart reading. It's all about learning about history, and it's a kind of detective story. What did these people believe? What were their techniques, and why did they practice what they did? So it's, it's fascinating to me on a lot of levels, including working with clients and, and doing practical chart reading. And so how do you merge the two? Because this is something that's very fascinating to me as someone who likes to think about philosophical ideas and as someone who's been so blessed to be able to interact with a lot of people in academia who are also astrologers. How do you find that bridge between what is essentially an esoteric practice or esoteric art and framing it in an academic context? Um, one way to look at it, I, I use roughly two models to think about this. One is Aristotle and one is the Stoics. And probably the easiest way to think about it is through Aristotle. So in a, in a philosophy like Aristotle's, the purpose of human life is to be happy. Um, and, uh, but there are uh, different areas of life in which you can achieve a kind of excellence, uh, moral excellence or practical excellence. And if you think about the houses in the chart, the houses describe different areas of life in which there might be a kind of uh, excellence and smoothness and well-functioning of things, or there might be difficulties to encounter. And so these categories like wealth, family, relationships, um, you might say are precisely the kinds of things that an Aristotelian would say, if these areas of life are going well, the person will be happy. If these areas of life are not going well, then the person uh, is less likely to be happy, uh, all things considered, and has some work to do. So what you can do is look at the chart with that idea in mind and help someone focus on what are the areas of life that you need to work on in order to have a more functional, happy uh, way of life? Um, so, in a sense, the ancient philosophers were outlining categories and attitudes that we, as we look at the houses in the chart, 
we're already looking at. Um, so the two go together very well. Um, the Stoics uh, thought that you could be happy under a variety of circumstances, and they had a kind of more spiritual view that in some senses allowed you to rise above the chart and not be thrown by problematic areas in the chart. So there's all sorts of ways that a, a traditional view of happiness and flourishing can go along with practical chart reading. So talk a little bit about the history, because you're so um, noted for translating these ancient astrological mm -hmm. texts. So talk a little bit about, first, the motivation to do that, what inspired you to do that, um, but also some of the key ideas that you found in these texts and why sharing those ideas matter. Well, I really got started on the translating. I, I've been doing a little bit on my own. Um, but I really got started uh, by someone that I had met who was a manuscript collector who handed me a, a copy of Guido Bonatti's book from the 1200s and said, I wish someone would translate this. Why don't you do it? Because he knew I was already doing some of it. And I just completely fell in love with all of the material and the historical research and the language. I, I just really enjoyed all of it. Um, as I said before, some of the you know, the history of astrology is in some ways a history of languages and empires. So the first important stage happened in Greek, in the Near East, and in Egypt, in uh, the areas that had been originally conquered by Greeks. Um, and uh, as the Persian Empire, the Sassanids, uh, rose uh, in the third century, um, they started taking Greek texts and translating them into Persian. And then when the uh, Arab Muslims started taking over, they took that material and translated it into Arabic. Um, and each civilization added a little bit as it went along. So for the first 1,700, 2,000 years of traditional astrology, there were differences in the texts and languages, but they tried to preserve what, had, what they had been bequeathed, uh, and then tried to refine it add to it a little bit to try to enrich our um, chart reading and techniques. One thing that I've been very fascinated about in my own uh, research, my own interest, has been um, this move between the Greeks who had a polytheistic mm -hmm. view of the world mm -hmm. and how the early Muslims, the Arabs, actually put astrology into a monotheistic context, mm -hmm. which really helped it, which was one stage of its survival, one evolution of astrology, mm -hmm. or one example of astrology responding to the cultural context it finds itself in. Can you talk a little bit about that, that shift between polytheistic worldview and monotheistic worldview as expressed in astrology? Well, in some ways, um in some ways, that polytheism never went away. Uh, it was just, in some ways, just ignored. Um, if you read a, some of the Arabic texts, they'll repeat the same techniques and everything from the Greek astrologers, but every once in a while, they will say, um, you know, inshallah, or they'll, they'll add a little, a little bit of the required Islamic statement. So, for example, mashallah who was a Persian Jew, was writing in Arabic, and he was a famous astrologer. And then at the end of the texts, uh, some of the texts that come down to us, he will suddenly say at the very end, and praise be on Muhammad and his family. But there's nothing in the astrology that requires him to say that. So in a way, the astrology, um, even though it had been polytheistic, was able to be transmitted in a way that um, could escape those kinds of rules. Uh, it's just that sometimes they would add a little line here and there. One thing that I remember about Mashallah's work was that, uh, that fascinated me, was this idea of where he starts talking about um, sort of like psychological prescriptions, if you will. And maybe that's not the right way to put it, but he starts saying things like, 
um, this person might have a temper and would do well to do X, mm -hmm. right? And that reminded me of, well, he's saying take actions like this or take an attitude like mm -hmm. this. It does remind me a little bit of Vedic astrology. We're, we are talking here about Western astrology. But with Vedic astrology, a lot of the solutions are you know, found in gems and, and things like that. Yep. But he's actually saying you can use your free will like this and work with this energy in that way. And so what do you make of that? Like, it, on the one hand, yes, it, I completely can see it. Astrology is a polytheistic worldview, and he's asserting that. And I love the diversity, because ultimately we call it Islamic astrology because that's who was funding the astrology. Those were the people who were the, the benefactors. But having said that, I would love for you to talk about how astrology began to become a tool instead of just being a predictor. Mm -hmm. There, There is, um, in Arabic, a number of texts that are about consecrating gems and amulets and rings. Um, there seems to be a distinction between the textbooks that tell you how to read a chart and then the books that tell you how to fix things and use magic and amulets and all of that sort of thing. Um, and, or, you know, it might say that um, you might consecrate this ring using this kind of stone and make sure that Capricorn is on the ascendant or the midhead and something like that. Um, but the, they seem to keep the two kinds of books separate. Now, I don't know if that was because they were trying to be safe or whether they just saw them as two different kinds of texts. There is uh, an Arabic text by Umar al-Tabari, who was a famous um, uh, medieval Arabic writing astrologer, where he records rituals and prayers to the planets and tells you what kind of clothing to wear, what kind of incense to burn, and it seems to be material that comes from places like um, Haram, in modern Turkey, where they were doing all of this star worshiping. So um, that was definitely part of what they were writing about, but what was often passed on were just the chart reading textbooks. So the, all of the magical side of things, the gems and the amulets and talismans, is still kind of undiscovered country. Um, and hopefully, uh, inshallah, it will be, um, we'll be able to translate more of that and see how the medievals were actually using remedial measures and so on, just like in India, as we see today. And so is that your next area of interest, translating some of these magical texts? I have a great interest in it. I have an Arabic series that I'm starting to plan out that would be more of the chart reading variety. But I do want to do some of the magical uh, material. Um, and you know, it could be um, it could be that some astrologers specialized in the chart reading, and then if you wanted to, you know, you know, have a, an amulet or something like that, maybe they would close, so to speak, close the chart reading book and open up the magic book and say, here's what we can do about it. Um, but they don't really talk about that. They seem to want to keep those bits separate. And that seems smart, actually. It survival. might have been very smart, yeah. <laughs> yes. It might have been very smart, yeah. Okay, is there anything else you want to share about this uh, amazing area of study that you have dedicated so much of your interest to? Um, I guess I'd say I'm really happy that so many people are responding to this traditional material. It is our past. Um, and for 2,000 years it was the standard way of looking at things, whether it's chart reading or the magical stuff. So I'm happy to see so many people interested and there's a lot more to come. And um, I think we can learn uh, plenty from uh, modern psychological type astrology. Um, but it's very important to recover our past and see the richness that's there. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for this moment, this very spontaneous moment. I just kind of grabbed you and said, I must talk to you, so thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here to celebrate the history of astrology and Benjamin Dykes with me. Until we connect again, take care.